Peace, peace, peace. Welcome back to the UNI Versal Temple for the sun, planets, moon, and stars. I'll be your Lord of hosts, Lord Messiah. And today we're going into the Prophet Muhammad, the lawgiver. And, um, you know, this right here, this document um, says the Prophet Muhammad honored by the U.S. Supreme Court as one of the greatest lawgivers of the world in 1935. Right. So we got to understand that the basis and the foundation of this so-called nation or country or whatever was actually based on Islamic principles, not Christian principles. Obama had quoted that in a speech he did. And they got, I think they're going to give that quote, you know, what I'm saying or a relevant quote in this uh, in this document. So let's let's get into this. Y'all. Prophet Muhammad honored by the U.S. Supreme Court as one of the greatest lawgivers of the world in 1935. Abdul Malik Mujahid. As the United States Supreme Court judges sit in the chamber, to their right, front, and the left sides are friezes depicting the 18 greatest lawgivers of the world. The second frieze to the right features a person holding a copy of the Quran, the Islamic holy book. It is intended to recognize Prophet Muhammad as one of the greatest lawgivers in the world, along with Moses, Solomon, Confucius, and Hammurabi, among others. Here is what the Supreme Court's website says about this frieze. Muhammad, c. 570 to 632, the prophet of Islam. He is depicted holding the Quran. The Quran provides the primary source of Islamic law. Prophet Muhammad's teachings explain and implement Quranic principles. The figure above is a well-intentioned attempt by the sculptor, Adolf Weinman, to honor Muhammad, and it bears no resemblance to Muhammad. Muslims generally have a strong aversion to sculptured or pictured representations of their prophet. In the year in which the frieze of Prophet Muhammad was erected, Franklin D. Roosevelt was president, and Charles Evans Hughes was the chief justice. It is not known how the court deliberated on this architectural contribution. No one at that time thought it inappropriate to include Prophet Muhammad as one of the greatest lawgivers of the world at the chambers of the United States Supreme Court. This was despite the fact that American society at that time was not as diverse as it is today. Uh -huh. Women had just acquired the right to vote, and Japanese Americans were about to be sent to concentration camps. While the learned people in our country knew of the contribution of Prophet Muhammad, our neighbors today are given regular doses of misinformation about the Prophet and Sharia, the path of the Prophet, more commonly described as Islamic law. Prophet Muhammad's Peace and Justice Movement Prophet Muhammad envisioned a just and peaceful society. The peace was Islam and the justice was the law. Hence, Islamic law. That's how he showed and proved his religion was government. Society. With a mass peace movement, he achieved this goal during his life. He hated war and always preferred a peace treaty with his opponents, even if it was not favorable to his and his followers' interests. He established his first peace sanctuary in the city of Medina without any war whatsoever. While he did fight to defend that peace sanctuary, it is critical to note that the total time of actual fighting defending his people was not more than six days in his life of 63 years. He struggled to secure a peace that ensured justice and liberation for all people, especially for those most marginalized and oppressed. Here are some of the Prophet's notable contributions. He taught that there is one God for all mankind. He taught Muslims to believe in all of the Prophets and all divinely revealed scriptures, especially biblical ones. Right. And um, this is why in the Quran, it says how uh, they are to follow the books that were revealed to them. So, for example, uh, Surah, Surah 5, Ayah 68 in the Holy Quran says, Christians have no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon the Torah, gospel, revelations that, were, that has come to them. And then Surah... Uh, 5 and 47 says, uh, Surah 5 and Ayah 47 says, Therefore, let those who follow the gospel judge according to what God has revealed in it. Those who do not judge by what God has sent down are rebellious. So, therefore, they're bound to, stu to study the books that they were given. You know what I'm saying? So, Basically, you know, a lot of times like the most a lot of Muslims be like, oh, they want everybody to convert to Islam, but everybody's not supposed to convert to Islam according to the Quran itself. 
You know what I mean? Like he told, you know what I'm saying? Allah told in the Quran that those people are supposed to study the books that came to them. And then the Muslims study the book that came to them, which was their revelation, the Quran. Let's continue. Ones. As the Prophet established a peace sanctuary called Medina after his migration from Mecca, he negotiated treaties with the Jews and the pagans of Medina. Muslims consider these treaties to be the first written surviving constitution in the world. The constitution guaranteed freedom of religion, self-governance, and legal autonomy in all matters. It called for the common defense of Medina and declared the Jews, pagans, and Muslims of that treaty to be one nation or one Ummah. He prohibited hunting and the cutting of trees in the peace sanctuary of Medina. He declared killing non-combatants to be illegal, placed severe restrictions on how warfare could be conducted, and even paid compensation for the killing of some dogs by one of his commanders. The Prophet's teachings and the Quran are the two major sources of Sharia. Some of his precepts include the following. Moral behavior, personal cleanliness, emphasis on preservation and nourishment of all life forms, including plants and animals, rituals and spirituality of prayers, fasting and charity, righteous conduct and good deeds and rights of parents, children, spouses, and neighbors. Interpersonal relations, teaching to enhance human relations and to avoid breaking relationships, encouraging mutual consultation in all affairs, prohibiting bigotry and racism, and emphasizing kindness and hospitality toward others, especially the weak and the poor. Mm -hmm. Financial guidelines, encouraging charity, rights of the poor, respect for workers, and rejection of exploitation and circulation of wealth among all classes. Mm -hmm. Personal rules and laws regarding privacy, gender relations, marriage, divorce, and inheritance. Criminal laws implementing the many of the Ten Commandments. The only one of the Ten Commandments not having a parallel statement in the Quran is the one having to do with keeping the Sabbath. Less than 2% of Quranic verses deal with the criminal law of Islam, which is a part of the Sharia, but not the totality of it. The Prophet asked his judges to make things easy for people, not difficult. He declared all sins forgivable as long as a person asks God's forgiveness and that of the one who has been wronged. The Prophet gave special emphasis to honoring treaties, standing up for justice, and opposing oppression. Why Muslims often demand Sharia in the Muslim world? In the Muslim world, many Muslims are sick and tired of their corrupt leaders. As such, they demand Sharia, envisioning a return to a just and peaceful system like the time when a caliph would submit himself without any immunity to a judge on an equal footing with his accuser. The United Nations gives all nations the right to self-determination. That is how even in the US brokered constitutions of Afghanistan and Iraq there is importance given to Sharia principles. Unfortunately, the brutal and often biased implementation of criminal law in some Muslim countries has given Sharia a bad name. The Prophet would be horrified to see this merciless brutality in the name of Islam by some Muslims. It is against Sharia to impose Sharia on anyone. Almost all the Sharia with which Muslim Americans deal relates to personal religious life, ethics, morality, and human relationships. Practicing Muslims live Sharia every day as they pray, fast, eat halal, permissible in Islam, food, practice charity, raise families, and serve communities. Sharia is like halacha, which is practiced by Jews in America. Jews in America even operate Jewish courts in the U.S., called Beth Din. Muslim yeah. Americans. Part of stuff y'all heard that is that Jews in America even operate Jewish courts in the U.S. called Beth Din. Look that up because I've been looking it up. I'm studying the structure and I'm learning things from that. Um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So that's how that's their Jewish courts. So when we be like, yo, all these all these uh, lawyers are Jews. These these judges are Jews. That's because they um, operate in Jewish courts in the U.S. So people could be operating Islamic courts in the U.S. You know, saying now, as far as the Sharia being implemented, that might be maybe a touchy thing. But um, as far as the other laws that are concerned, then yeah, they could be implementing that as well. And I'm going to get into um, showing in the Quran how the Prophet Muhammad had made this peace treaty and this, this declaration, and they talk about administration, the, a decree, um, Islamic State, uh, you know what I'm saying, and, and get all into this legal terminology, you know what I'm saying, which is also further shown and proven how they're saying how, you know, the Prophet Muhammad was honored as one of the greatest lawgivers, you know what I'm saying, and uh, yeah. So this is like information shown and proven on that statement, you know what I'm saying, uh, information backing it up. So let's continue. 
Americans do not operate any such courts. Muslim, Muslim Americans are subject to U.S. laws, just like. Pardon me, I said Muslim Americans do not operate any such courts. So, like Muslim Americans should be having their courts. There's Islamic courts here as well. You know what I'm saying? Because um, they they they're not biased against it in the beginning. They're about to put the quote how they can't necessarily be biased against it, and they weren't biased against it in the beginning. You know what I mean? But let's let's go. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship. See what happened was that see the Europeans they got so strong in their political and commercial uh, influence and power that they just disregard the treaty now. Now it's like, ah, oh, well, what are you going to do? We got a military. We got all the commercial power. We got the money and the resources. What you going to do? You know what I'm saying? So that's where it's come to the point of, you know what I'm saying? But had the, the, the Muslim Americans or the quote unquote Moorish Americans been manifesting the Islamic law here, like, like in the courts, 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 their own court, court, courts. Yeah. Then shit will start changing. Let's go. Like any other citizen, Muslim Americans are subject to U.S. laws, just like any other citizens. No Muslim has called for the replacement of the U.S. Constitution with Sharia. Sharia is neither a constitution nor is it all law. It is actually against Sharia to impose Sharia on anyone. Further, Sharia only applies to Muslims, not to non-Muslims. Muslims have been demanding equal protection under the U.S. Constitution since their rights are regularly violated in the current Islamophobic environment in which we are living, where Muslims are continuously targeted and subjected to bigotry and prejudice. America's founding fathers were wise people. Today's Islamophobes can learn a great deal from them. In the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1796, between the United States and Tripoli they stated, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslim men, Muslims. Further reading. For more Muslim perspectives about Sharia, please visit sharia101.org. Please also read Rose Wilder Lane's Discovery of Freedom. She is the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, of Little House on the Prairie fame. She considered Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Abraham, and the American Revolution to be the three major sources of freedom in the world. Muhammad, A Prophet for Our Time, by Karen Armstrong, published by HarperCollins Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources, by Martin Lings, published by Inner Traditions. Uh, part of self, now let me go back up to that quote real fast, it just kind of read past that kind of quick. Okay, so let me say it says, uh, American founding fathers were wise people. Today's Islamophobias, uh, Islamophobes can learn a great deal from them <clears throat> in the treaty of peace and friendship of 1796 i don't think there's 1796 i think it's 1786 but um yeah um between the united states oh part of self united states and tripoli okay that's so why did they say trip all right well anyway united states and tripoli they said as the government of the united states of america is not in this is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, let me run that back, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has <clears throat> in itself no character or enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslim men, of Mus uh, excuse me, Muslim men, which is Muslims. So basically they have no, they have no, you know, no gripe against the Muslims or not supposed to, and their government is not based on Christian religion. So when they told that God bless America and all of that and da 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 da, one nation under God and da -da, eh, that's not necessarily Islam, that's not necessarily Christian um, religion. You know what I mean? Or, or even principles that may stem back to Islamic principles. But since people don't know the history, they'll just think, oh, they, the United States made up everything. Yeah, they taught us everything. No, we taught them. But anyway, I'm going to end this right here. I'm going to get into the next one. Join me on a part two. The next one is going into uh, right here. Chapter nine. At Ta'uba which is chapter nine or surah nine in the Quran. And we about to get into this declaration right here. All right. So y'all join me on the next one. Y'all see y'all. Peace.